Hi everyone. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get ready to start. So I'll, have, I'll introduce Vanessa from ARIA National and uh, she will introduce our first speaker. Good morning, everyone. Our first speaker today is Doug Winfrey. He's the brand manager of Remax Commercial. Doug? Hi, how's everybody doing? Good afternoon or uh, good morning to you, depending on where you're calling in from. I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for attending and certainly uh, wanted to thank everyone at ARIA for all of the hard work that goes into putting these webinars on. You know, we've had a, a long relationship with ARIA over the last several years and we're always thrilled to participate in these webinars and other uh, events the organization holds throughout the year. I uh, also just wanted to thank uh, the speakers as well for carving out time to chat with us today. So thank you to both uh, Evan Lydier and Rick Sharga. Um, like uh, uh, was mentioned, I am the commercial brand manager with Remax here at World Headquarters in Denver, Colorado. And really in my role as commercial brand manager, I essentially serve as a subject matter expert for all things that pertain to uh, you know, commercial real estate outside uh, and both in the region organization. Um, I also get to work closely with both Ann Miller and Mike Reagan. Uh, Ann Miller, who some of you may know, served as the co-chair of ARIA's luxury event earlier this year in Seattle and works very closely with the ARIA Denver chapter. And Mike, Mike Reagan is a senior vice president, 26-year uh, REMAX veteran, and has really been instrumental in you know, growing this REMAX ARIA relationship since he's taken over. Uh, you know, the big aim of our group here at REMAX is to bring the most value possible that we can to our commercial practitioners and really just work as hard as we can and do everything that we can to get more exposure to the REMAX commercial brand throughout the commercial industry. Just make sure that, uh, you know, uh, competitors uh, know that we're out there and are on notice. Um, you know, to that end, partnerships with organizations like ARIA are key to expanding our footprint in the commercial real estate world and increasing the visibility of the REMAX commercial name, uh, you know, kind of across the world. Um, you know, last year was uh, a big year of growth for REMAX Commercial. Uh, we finished the year with over 3,300 commercial practitioners, we were about 658 commercial offices and divisions, and had practitioners representing the REMAX Commercial brand in 67 different countries. Um, those 3,300 practitioners completed uh, well over 32,000 transactions that totaled over $13.4 billion, and that $13.4 billion uh, uh, dollars in transactions done last year represents about a 37% increase in what we did uh, for commercial volume in 2016. So certainly something that we're uh, all very proud of and hopeful uh, uh, for continued growth going forward. Um, you know, really what we attribute that, that success to is just kind of our entrepreneurial environment. We, we operate in a very unique um, the commercial real estate realm where our practitioners are able to do commercial real estate that way. They will do commercial real estate and ultimately have the opportunity to make them a, a bigger paycheck at the end of the day once the deal is closed. Uh, with that, I wanted to just quickly uh, take a moment to introduce Rick Sharga, who I've had the pleasure yeah. of to know over the last year or so. Uh, Rick recently joined Carrington Mortgage Holdings, which owns and operates multiple businesses in asset management, mortgage origination and service, and real estate transactions and logistics. Uh, prior to joining uh, Carrington, Rick spent five years at 10X, where he first served as the executive vice president of the company's auction.com business unit, and then later as the company's chief marketing officer. Uh, he also spent eight years with Realty Track, where as a senior VP, he was responsible for all marketing, business development, and data operations, and actually won a Stevie Award for National Marketing Executive of, of the Year. Uh, he's also one of the country's most frequently quoted sources on real estate, mortgage, and foreclosure trends, and appeared on CNBC, CBS Evening News, NBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, Bloomberg, probably a few other organizations that I'm forgetting as well. Uh, Rick is also a member of the Corporate Board of Governors for NARREP, the uh, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate uh, Professionals. Uh, and he, 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 don't, don't worry about him. And he's also on the uh, board uh, for the Asian Real Estate Association of America. Uh, he's a member, he's a five-star, he's a member of the Five Star National Mortgage Servicing Association and was included in Inman's uh, 100, the annual list of the most influential leaders in both uh, real estate in 2013 and 2014. And with that, 
yeah, I'll turn that over to uh, Rick. Thanks again for joining us, Rick. Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I would ask uh, Jazz and the Please other help. event organizers if they can try and put all the other attendees uh, on mute I as was the point. Uh, another half. Uh, and, um, yes, yeah, so if you yeah. give me one second, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do yeah. that right now. I think I think you have achieved the mission, Jazz. Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right, just just to be on the safe side, I, I'm I'm hoping that everybody can still hear me. Um, I, I know my wife and kids would love to be able to hit a mute button and, and make me be quiet, but um, that hasn't been invented yet, so we're we're, we're working on that, I guess. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, happy uh, and really really delighted that Ari has asked me to come back and and speak on this subject again. Um, and uh, we have an awful lot of information to cover in a relatively short period of time. Uh, there's some really, really interesting stuff coming up uh, after my sec segment uh, where, where Edmund Lydiard uh, from NAR is going to talk a, lo a lot about what's going on with, uh, with the new tax regulations and how they'll impact the real estate business. Uh, and I know you're all interested in that. So I'm going to kind of go through um, a number of topics. We're going to look at, at uh, overall commercial real estate sales volume and pricing, uh, what trends we're seeing right now in, in 2018. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little deeper dive into multifamily, retail, and industrial. Uh, we're going to hold off on questions and answers till the very end, uh, but just in case it wasn't mentioned earlier, uh, if you'd like to ask any of the pre presenters questions, uh, put them into the chat area. Uh, we will hopefully have time at the end of today's session to respond uh, to, to some of those questions or all those questions. Uh, and and I've, I've also personally committed to Aria that if there are questions for the materials that I'm covering that we don't get to during the webcast, uh, I'll be happy to answer them after the fact. Uh, I'll also be putting my contact information up at the end of my presentation uh, just in case anybody wants to ask questions or get in touch uh, later on. But, but this is what we're going to cover in my segment that I'm going to turn over to Evan, as I mentioned earlier, who's going to talk, talk uh, uh, through the, the implications for real estate, commercial real estate in particular, uh, from the new tax code. Uh, a lot of the information I'm going to present today is uh, courtesy of, of my friends at 10X, my, my prior company. Uh, 10X Commercial uh, has a research section on their website um, that has a lot of, of very useful information on the CRE market and, and various segments of the market. Uh, and also uh, content from the Mortgage Bankers Association, uh, which, which uh, publishes an awful lot of really good commercial data. Uh, so uh, you'll, you'll see them uh, cited as we go through the, the slides today. Uh, good news, I guess, uh, is, is that uh, commercial real estate activity started off 2018 uh, a little more uh, strongly than, than uh, we ended 2017. Uh, we're also slightly up on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, deal volume, if you look at the five major property types, uh, industrial, uh, office, retail, hotel, and, and multifamily or apartment, uh, is up 6.7% on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, about $107 billion uh, in, in assets traded. Now, that's down a little bit from the previous two quarters, uh, but you have to keep in mind that, that commercial real estate tends to uh, increase in volume as the year goes on. Uh, a lot of the, the, the annual budgets are spent in the fourth quarter of the year on, on commercial real estate transactions, uh, and therefore the third and fourth quarters tend to be very heavy relative to other quarters of the year. Um, the volume uh, re is still off uh, the peak set earlier in, in this particular cycle. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, but I, And pricing is, is slowing down. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit, too. Um, one of the interesting uh, things that we're seeing, uh, and there was a, a separate report out on this, uh, I, I guess if you're in C-Area, a lot of you are probably familiar with something called the Dodge Momentum Index. Uh, and it, it was at uh, 167.8 in May, figure that 100 is the index, so anything above 100 is positive. So that May reading was up almost two points from April. Uh, and, and the Dodge Momentum Index typically takes a look at, at construction forecasts. Uh, and so what this index suggests is that there should still be growth in terms of commercial real estate construction uh, through 2019. Um, now, the, their index peaked at almost 200 back in, in December of 07. Um, 
So we, we, we may not want to be at that peak again because you might remember what happened right after December of 07 uh, was all the nastiness in 2008. Um, but uh, the, the the trough uh, was was at uh, um, uh, was was back in in, in uh, 2012, uh, and and we've come back significantly since then. So good news again. Uh, we're we're still looking at a uh, hundred a hundred billion dollar quarters, uh, and and this year started off a little bit better than last year finished, and is a little bit up on a year over year basis. Uh, as I mentioned, all the segments are a little bit off peak. Uh, and not surprising when you see something like that happen, uh, construction has plateaued. Uh, and, and that's based on the, the dollar value of, of construction projects. So the, the value of those projects has fallen on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, it's, it's fallen significantly for multifamily uh, office and manufacturing facilities. Uh, it's risen a little bit for lodging and for healthcare. So depending on what segment of the market you're looking at, uh, you, you might be getting somewhat different results. Um, in terms of, of sales and, and pricing in general, uh, sales volume in the fourth quarter of 07 uh, was, was off 7% from the year prior. Um, and sales of apartment properties were down about 7%. Uh, office properties were down about 8%. Uh, retail properties were off by 18%, probably not a huge surprise to anybody. Uh, industrial properties, on the other hand, saw an increase of 20%. We'll get into a little bit of, of the reasons for that uh, shortly. If you look at the first quarter of this year, as I mentioned, it was $107 billion billion overall. Um, it, it was the, 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 uh, one of the lowest levels in the past five quarters, but it was up on a volume basis uh, almost 7% from a year ago. Uh, apartment sector, again, had a decline in the quarter, about $12, $12 billion. Uh, offices were off by another 9 uh, but, but again, hotel and industrial sectors were both, uh, were both going up. Uh, retail transactions are, are off. Pricing is holding reasonably well, surprisingly, uh, considering everything that's going on in the retail sector. But, but again, if you, if you look at, at where we were back in the peak, where that, that, uh, uh, that, that huge spike back in 07, you can see that, uh, uh, that the market is, 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 is still stronger than it was uh, during the, the worst, but it, it is definitely off the most recent peak. And, and that's to be expected because we're already 28 quarters into the recovery. Uh, so you see what that, uh, that wave looked like going into 07, uh, the fall off that happened after that. You see we, got, we actually got back and surpassed peak uh, recently, but, but we have stabilized at a, a somewhat lower rate. One of the things that a lot of analysts were concerned about was that um, commercial property pricing was outpacing fundamentals. Uh, you'll see a little bit of that as we get into to cap rates and, and risk premiums. Uh, but, but it does seem like the market's adjusting a little bit now, uh, and pricing seems to be getting a little bit more in line uh, with what we would expect given the, the underlying fundamentals of the marketplace. And by that, all I mean is uh, what, what are people likely to be able to re recoup, uh, whether it's a cash-on-cash cash cash, uh, kind of return on investment uh, or it's, uh, it's price appreciation on the assets themselves. Uh, pricing for the last few years had outpaced. Uh, either of those metrics, uh, a lot of it was based on the availability of really, really historically cheap capital, uh, but those rates are starting to go up, and so pricing seems to be a, a little bit more normalized than it was a couple of years ago. Uh, that said, uh, pricing and vacancy does remain strong. If you look at the uh, last quarter of last year, which uh, some of the more recent data that we have, uh, apartment vacancy rates. Uh, uh, went up to about 4.5%. That's still very strong if you look at uh, historic numbers. Overall, multifamily vacancy rates were at closer to 8%, uh, but, but usually those, those numbers are somewhere in the 6% range for apartments, so 4.5% is, is still pretty strong. Uh, rents, unsurprisingly, also went up uh, by about 4.2% from the prior year. Uh, office vacancy rates were up uh, by 10%, or to 10%. Uh, they were only up 0.1% uh, uh, on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, but, but the, the vacancy rates, the, the slightly reduced level of demand for offices, uh, and, and that's due to a number of trends. Uh, you're, you're looking at uh, more uh, hoteling kind of situations. You're looking at a lot more telecommuting. Uh, you're looking at uh, more technologically advanced office spaces uh, with open floor environments, and so there's less per employee office space required for a lot of these buildings. 
Uh, and that's a trend that's holding true whether you're looking at central business districts or suburban offices. Uh, so something to think about if you're, if you're representing clients who are selling offices or if you have clients looking to, to lease or buy office space. Office rents were up almost 2% year over year. Uh, retail vacancy was all the way up to about 16.4%. Uh, and rents, uh, surprisingly, uh, were, were up all, almost 2% there as well. Uh, so, so we are seeing um, kind of a mixed bag. In terms of overall pricing, uh, if you look at some of the numbers that, that were, were out in the marketplace, uh, Real Capital Analytics, RCA, reported a, about a 1.3% increase uh, in property values in the fourth quarter. Um, there are some other, N NCRE IF reported a 0.7% decline. Uh, and Green Street Advisors uh, reported a 1% decline. So, so it's a mixed bag in terms of overall pricing. A lot of it depends on the nature of properties that are being measured. Uh, but again, the, the, the pricing of properties looks like it's getting a little bit more rational. Uh, 10X puts out something they call a, a commercial real estate nowcast. Uh, and and the, the nowcast uh, looks at, at a number of different variables. Um, it, it looks at uh, some reports that come out from CITUS. Uh, it looks at uh, Google Analytics. It looks at, the, at 10X's uh, own sales volume. And it surveys uh, several dozen economists and analysts who follow the real estate space. Um, it, it gained, uh, if, if, you can, if you can kind of ferret through all of the, the lines you're seeing on the screen right there, uh, it gained about 0.1% in April uh, compared to March. Uh, but this is the first time since 10X has been doing its, its nowcast that it's actually below its year-ago level. Uh, so the, the nowcast is actually down about 1.4% from a year ago, uh, and it does look like the gains that we've seen in interest rates uh, and the volatility in some of the equity prices are, are starting to have an impact uh, on, on what we're seeing uh, across the board in, in, uh, in pricing. And, and that's, uh, that's true in, in all of 10X's uh, now cast uh, uh, looks, uh, for example, um, the office now cast was up 1% on the year, uh, but it, it really depends on what part of the country you're looking at. So the Southwest in the office market had a, almost 4% gain, whereas the Midwest saw about a 1% decline. Um, uh, the, the retail now cast, um, actually the people that are buying these properties uh, appear to be paying more for the properties that are there, but, but the, the demand is, is relatively weak. Um, the apartment uh, now cast was down a little bit. Uh, hotels were off by almost four, four points. Um, I'm sorry, hotels were down by about uh, um, uh, one point, uh, but, but apartments were down about four points on a year-over-year -year basis. So uh, as, as interest rates go up, as uh, the markets uh, show a little bit more volatility, we're seeing an impact uh, on pricing. Uh, cap rates uh, are, are another another area that uh, uh, we we're seeing continued compression in. Um, that's probably not a surprise because as prices have gone up, uh, cap rates uh, automatically kind of uh, get get compressed a bit. Um, they are in fact uh, trading at below their 10-year averages in, in pretty much uh, every category, uh, and 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 that's probably not a huge shock again. Uh, between prices going up, uh, and they have been going up, uh, and interest rates now going up, uh, it does make it very difficult uh, for, for cap rates to, to get back to more normal levels. Uh, retail probably saw the biggest change uh, in cap rates. Uh, the, the cap rates moved up 30 basis points in the first quarter. Um, all of the other sectors were within 10, 10 basis points of the, the prior quarter. Um, uh, the industrial cap rates brought them uh, just uh, 10 basis points higher than their, their cyclical low, uh, and more, but, but still more than 100 basis points off their historical average. So from an investment perspective, no matter which segment of the market you're looking at, uh, you're still looking at very tight cap rates. And, and that's probably to be expected uh, until prices normalize and, and while we're seeing uh, the cost of capital go up. Um, but the, you know, the people that are looking for those uh, seven, eight, nine uh, cap rates are, are, are hard pressed to find anything like that these days, uh, and that uh, also uh, equates to, to risk premiums uh, falling a little bit as well. And, and for for discussion purposes, a risk premium simply is the the amount above 
uh, what uh, a treasury yield would look like uh, that an investor is willing to pay for uh, for an asset uh, in, in the commercial market. Uh, and so we saw treasury rates go up to 2.8% in the first quarter, which is the highest they've been since the beginning of 2014. Uh, that was a 40 basis point rise from the previous quarter. Uh, didn't have a whole lot of effect on cap rates, but, but it certainly did have an effect uh, on, on the, the risk spreads that people are willing to take. Uh, they're not willing to pay those increased rates into uh, increased prices. Um, and so, so we're seeing that uh, the spreads are narrowing. So risk, risk premiums across all the segments uh, fell from the prior quarter. Uh, industrial risk, risk premiums fell 50 basis points uh, over the year. Um, it's the first time they've been below 3% since the recession. Uh, apartment spreads are down 40 basis points from a year ago. Uh, office and retail sectors are about unchanged. Um, the hotel sector was the only sector with a higher risk premium. Uh, so for whatever reason, investors in that segment seem to be willing to take on a little more risk uh, when it comes to pricing out the assets that they're interested in buying. So as you're looking at this from a client perspective, uh, good to know what the competitive uh, environment is like. Are people going to be bidding up certain segments more than other segments? Uh, for example, looks like if you have a client interested in hotels, and a lot of the hotel volume over the last year, by the way, has been in what the industry refers to as limited service hotels, uh, lower price properties. Uh, but, but again, that's a place where you're likely to see a little bit more price competition for the assets. So I'm going to kind of run through these next few slides fairly quickly, uh, and a lot of this is courtesy, again, of, of 10X. Um, I want to talk a little about what's going on in, in some, of the, uh, some of the hotter sectors. Uh, and again, I'm not sure uh, how many of you work in the industrial sector, but it is one of the fastest growing sectors in the marketplace, uh, being driven largely by, by three trends. One is uh, that as e-commerce is taking more uh, and more business in the retail sector, those e-commerce retailers uh, need industrial properties to serve as, as distribution warehouse facilities. We're also seeing an incre increasing uh, growth in cloud computing. Uh, companies like Amazon, and Microsoft, and, and Google, uh, and, and those companies also need industrial uh, centers uh, to house the servers that, that uh, they use for cloud computing. Uh, and the other is cannabis, and, and we're seeing a lot of, of both uh, production facilities and warehousing and growing facilities uh, as, as uh, cannabis has become legalized in more and more markets. So unsurprisingly, the industrial sector is growing. Uh, industrial pricing averaged $81 per square foot, uh, which is up 4% from 2016. Uh, the deal volume was up over 3%, uh, $18.6 billion in the fourth quarter alone. Production uh, marked its highest level since the year end of 2014, uh, and the annual effective uh, rent growth uh, reached its cyclical high at 4.4%. Uh, it is forecast to slow in coming years, and, and that could be uh, because there, there, there might be a little bit of oversupply forecast. It might also be uh, because uh, of some of the industrial sectors now, uh, uh, the industrial building now is, are, are going up in lower priced uh, areas, and that could be having an impact on pricing. Uh, you would expect a growing sector to have pricing going up, but that hasn't necessarily been the case. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the buy and sell markets that uh, the 10X has identified, uh, and they, they base this on, on, on market trends, um, they're looking at, at markets in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio as being uh, perhaps, perhaps peaking and, and, and good markets to think about selling, uh, as well as Baltimore and Cleveland. Uh, if you look at markets that they recommend as being uh, good opportunities for buying, you can look at markets like San Francisco, if you can find anything. Uh, Oakland, San Jose, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of interest in uh, the Central Valley of California. Uh, really, if you drew a line from uh, Modesto and Stockton down to uh, Riverside and San Bernardino, uh, industrial distribution centers and, and somewhat lower priced re real, estate, uh, real estate footprints to build on. Multifamily, we're starting to think, may have peaked. Um, and and, and uh, uh, that's interesting because household formation hasn't been as strong as, as uh, we would have expected at this point. We still have the uh, largest number of young adults living at home with their parents that we've ever had in history. So there is pent up household formation waiting to happen. Uh, it, as, as the numbers here suggest, it remains steady around 1.2 million 
new households formed in 2016. Uh, full year 2017 numbers aren't out yet, uh, but they're not significantly stronger. Uh, cap rates, as I mentioned earlier, are, are still flat, relatively low. Uh, deal volume is, is coming back a little bit. We're seeing more sales of multifamily and apartment buildings. Uh, and uh, effective rent growth decelerated uh, to 3.3%, but, but keep in mind, we're still talking about growth. We're not talking about rental rates going down. It's just that the prices uh, are, are increasing more slowly. Um, I dare you to really see this chart without blowing it up a little bit, but, but basically what the chart's saying is uh, we're, we're starting to see uh, a higher percentage of new households uh, occupied by owners rather than renters, uh, and that reverses a trend we saw really since the housing market bust uh, back in 08 and 09. Um, and for three consecutive quarters now, we've seen more growth in the owner segment than we've seen in the renter segment. And uh, in, in just to, to cite a recent quarter, uh, there were 1.5 million uh, new owners, uh, and there were 76,000 fewer renters. So uh, we, as household formation goes up, uh, we will continue to see both more opportunities for rental units and for owner-occupied units, uh, but the trend has been significantly stronger in the uh, the owner side than the renter side, uh, which is why we think the multifamily market may have peaked. Uh, again, if you're looking at buy versus sell markets, uh, 10x looks at areas, uh, and this probably isn't a big surprise if you've been following this closely, but a lot of the bigger markets uh, appear to be overbuilt or at least overpriced. Uh, and rental rates are starting to come back down. So if you look at markets like New York City, uh, Miami, San Jose, San Francisco, uh, Oakland, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing markets that may have peaked, uh, maybe good times to look at perhaps moving some of those, those assets. Uh, if you look at places like Sacramento, Riverside, San Bernardino, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, those are all markets that seem to still have a little bit of, of growth uh, and headroom uh, and, and, and might be markets that are, are worth looking at as, as markets to buy in. Uh, the retail apocalypse that has long been rumored uh, does seem to be uh, be happening. Um, retail absorption was below 2 million square feet for the past three quarters. Uh, cap rates are, are up from their all-time low, but still only at about 66%. Deal volume was down 15.3% uh, at the end of the fourth quarter. Uh, effective rents are up just 3.8% from the pre-recession peak. Uh, and, and again, we're, we're seeing um, there's really nothing but bad news when it comes to national retailers, uh, whether you're looking at Toys R Us closing or Nine West uh, or, or, you know, the ongoing misery at, at Sears and, and Kmart. Uh, a lot of the big box stores, a lot of the suburban malls uh, are really hurting. We are seeing some growth in urban areas. Uh, we're seeing a lot of retail space being converted to mixed use. Uh, again, particularly in urban environments where you're seeing uh, apartments and uh, offices and uh, entertainment and retail all under the same roof. You're seeing some retail converted into healthcare facilities, which is really kind of interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of conversion going on. Construction, uh, understandably, is a little low. Uh, and, and as e-commerce continues to eat away at, at market share and as demographic trends uh, shift people out of, of traditional markets into uh, the South and Southwest, uh, you're going to see a lot of the retail franchises in those areas struggle. Uh, I interestingly, the only market where we saw retail growth really over the last year was in the South, a little bit in the Southwest, but it, it's following population trends. Um, so unsurprisingly, you're, you're seeing markets uh, like, um, Houston, like Austin in Texas, like Houston, like Dallas, uh, to, to another extent to places like Denver and Salt Lake City uh, as being potential growth areas for retail, uh, whereas you're seeing more traditional markets in the Midwest, uh, Kansas City, uh, Chicago, Memphis, places in the Northeast like Northern New Jersey, places like Detroit, uh, struggling a little bit to maintain pace. So it, it's a, a mixed bag uh, in, in, in most of these segments. Um, I guess way to summarize, uh, the market is still healthy. Uh, it doesn't look like there's another bust on the horizon, uh, at least not anytime soon. Uh, the prices and volume are slowing down. A lot of it depends on the segment you're in and the region uh, that you're in, uh, and, and you're, you're probably better, uh, better able to sort out the local market opportunities where you are than, than from a centralized location. 
Uh, if you have investors looking for high cap rates, you're going to be hard pressed to find those. Uh, but as pricing rationalizes, we, we ultimately should see cap rates get back to within their their their, their normal 10-year averages. Multifamily looks like it's peaking. Retail is struggling. The industrial segment is growing, uh, and and those are kind of the highlights. Be happy to. Uh, engage in more detailed conversations if you're interested, and you can reach me here. You can also uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, mention uh, if you if you do ask to link with me on LinkedIn, uh, mention the Aria uh, webcast so I know where you're coming from. Uh, simply because I get a lot of requests and I don't accept everybody who who asks to link in. I'm going to turn it over now to Evan Lydiard, who's a CPA, he's a senior policy representative uh, for federal taxation, the National Association of Realtors. Uh, Evan joined the National Association of Realtors in January 2013 after serving for more than 20 years as a senior tax policy advisor to Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, uh, the current chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. Evan was Senator Hatch's lead advisor on tax policy issues, uh, as well as issues relating to the budget, financial services, and Social Security. So he's certainly as qualified an individual as we could possibly hope to, to have uh, to talk about uh, the new Tax Reform Act. Uh, before going to Capitol Hill, Evan was a tax manager in the Salt Lake City and Washington National, National Tax Offices of Deloitte, where he worked on a variety of corporate small business tax issues, uh, as well as on individual and uh, estate tax matters. Um, uh, in, in the midst of his uh, time at Capitol Hill, he also spent three years uh, as a partner at the legislative tax practice of KPMG's National Tax Office in D.C. Um, Mr. Lydiard received his undergraduate degree in accounting from the University of Utah, magna cum laude, uh, was working in the Senate and he, when he completed his master's degree in legislative affairs from the George Washington University and a master's degree in taxation from American University. Uh, he received a CPA license in 1983, uh, earning national and state recognition for his high scores on the examination. Uh, besides his day job, he's also currently an adjunct professor in the business graduate tax program at American University in Washington, where he teaches a tax policy course as well as a course on the taxation of real estate transactions. He also currently serves as a member of the Tax Executive Committee of the American Institute of CPAs. So everything you ever needed to know about taxes, and especially what it means for commercial real estate, uh, I'm very pleased to, to hand the ball over to uh, Evan Lydiard. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and thanks everybody for inviting me to be with you today. Here is what I hope to accomplish during our short time together. First, I want to give you just a little bit of background about the new tax bill. Second, I want to outline the major provisions affecting commercial real estate. And third, go over a big change that will most likely affect the personal taxes of real estate professionals. So let's get started. As someone who's been involved in tax policy in Washington for more than 30 years now, I can tell you that enactment of last year's tax bill came as a big surprise. For most of last year, it did not appear that this bill had much of a chance of moving. There's a long story to it, but we only have time for the abridged version. That, th this bill had many births, but the latest one was a, a campaign document in the summer of 2016 that was known as the Tax Reform Blueprint that some of you may have heard of. After the election of Donald Trump in November 2016, and that made it more likely that a Republican-style tax reform might be passed, this document grew from a campaign promise into a plan. However, for many political and procedural reasons, progress on this plan was at a stalemate for most of last year. There were lots of meetings and plenty of bluster, but no one really knew just how it was going to be accomplished. All during the summer into the early fall, the smart money was against the bill going anywhere. But then last September, two things happened, which by themselves might not have led to much. But together, they created what I call a perfect storm that made the very unlikely, not just possible, but almost inevitable. The first of these game changers happened on September 19th when Senator Bob Corker, a Republican from Tennessee, changed his position and decided to join the other Republican members in backing a tax bill that loses $1.5 trillion in revenue over 10 years. Up to this time, it had been assumed that the tax bill would have to be revenue neutral, creating as many losers as winners by lowering the tax rates and broadening the base by uh, shutting out certain deductions. In other words, 
Suddenly, Republicans decided that tax reform could be a tax cut, and a huge one at that. The second event happened the very next week, when it became clear that Senate Republicans did not have the 50 votes needed to repeal Obamacare, and you'll all remember how important and what a big promise that had been. When it became clear that the Senate could not get the votes needed to repeal Obamacare, the Republican leadership pulled the plug on that goal and decided to focus its attention for the rest of the year on tax reform. But this failure to re repeal Obamacare was a big problem for Republicans who had majorities in both houses and now occupied the White House as they could not point to even one major legislative victory. And with the 2018 elections just about a year away, they all knew they needed a big victory to show they could get some things done if they were going to do well at the polls uh, in this November. In other words, getting a victory on tax reform became an imperative, not just a wish list item. Now let's take a look at the details that affect commercial real estate. Let's first start with the individual rates, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. The extra $1.5 trillion added to this bill means that not every single dollar of tax reduction, a lot of which is reflected in this chart, uh, has to be offset by a tax increase somewhere else. The result of these tax rate cuts is that many people will be enjoying a tax reduction, and some, especially at the higher end of the income spectrum, could be coming out very well. I won't go through a lot of uh, time to, to take, but th 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 these are the results for a single individual at four different levels of income. And as you can see, there's big tax change uh, savings, especially at the higher rate of uh, a million dollars of income. But there are also tax cuts uh, possible in other parts of the bill, but uh, this one applies uh, as much to commercial real estate as anywhere else, so I, I wanted to start on this one. But let's talk about other wins for commercial real estate. By now, I'm sure you all know about the changes to the deductibility of mortgage interest. I'm going to mention it here just to clarify that the new $750,000 limit does not apply to commercial or investment property. This is also true of the new $10,000 cap on the amount of the deduction for state and local property tax payments. They don't apply on the commercial side, only for the uh, individuals who live in their own homes. However, you may have heard that the new law does have a 30% limit on the deductibility of interest expenses for businesses. Fortunately, though, real estate businesses have been exempted from that limit. Also, businesses with average annual gross receipts that don't exceed $25 million a year are exempted. More good news. The provision that we feared the most that would make its way into the tax bill that would harm commercial real estate more than about anything else was not included. This was the repeal of the Section 1031 Lot County Exchange. Now, the bill didn't repeal 1031, but only for personal property. Real property exchanges are left as they were in the prior law, and that's big, big news. There's also good news for those of you who care about, care about carried interest. There was a change to require that an investment be held for at least three years in order to get the capital gains tax rate under the carried interest rules, but this is a huge win for real estate because in many, if not most cases, the property is being held at least this long anyway. And there's some good news on the depreciation front as well. Qualified improvement property, which is now comprised of leasehold improvements, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail improvement property is all treated the same under the new tax law and can be, can be depreciated over 15 years. Even better, all of this property is now eligible for immediate expensing under Section 179, if, if you're not too big for 179. And that provision has been extended and expanded to cover the first $1 million of property placed in service per year, with the phase-out range expanded to $2.5 million. The prior limits were $500,000 and $2 million. So it's more available than ever before, and it includes more real estate than ever before. There's some mixed news in a couple of areas uh, related to commercial real estate, however. First, there's uh, both good news and less than good news for those of you who are concerned with the low-income housing tax credit. The good news is that the credit was not repealed, as many had feared. 
The not so good news is that with the major reduction in the corporate income tax rate from 35% down to 21%, the credit has become less valuable and the incentive value is reduced. And that's going to translate probably into fewer low-income low housing units being built in the future. The final area of this section is the rehabilitation credit for old and historic buildings that some of you may be concerned with. This credit has had two parts in the past, a 10% credit for buildings constructed before 1936 and a 20% credit for certified historic structures. This area has some good news and bad news too. The bad news is that the 10% credit has been repealed. The better news is that the 20% credit for historic structures has just been cut back and now has to be claimed over a five-year period instead of uh, every year. But I now want to take a look at a very positive change brought about in this new tax law that some of you may or may not have heard about before. This is a brand new deduction for people working through various kinds of mostly small businesses, including sole proprietorships. And it's known as the Section 199A deduction. This new deduction was one of the biggest surprises of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, or last year's tax bill. As I've been giving presentations about the new tax law, I've been really surprised at how many people are not yet aware of it or don't know that it could be available to them. Now, the centerpiece of last year's tax reform bill, as I mentioned, was a huge reduction in the corporate tax rate from 35% all the way down to 21%. But as you all know very well, not all business activity takes place by regular C corporations. More than 90% of all America's businesses are pass-through entities that generate roughly half of America's business activity. Now, the architects on Capitol Hill and in the White House of this tax bill realized that if they were going to cut the tax rate for large corporations, there also had to be major tax-cutting opportunities for non-corporate businesses, and that's what this does. Let's go through a series of questions to help clarify what this does for people. This deduction is available for tax years 2018 through 2025 and is set to expire after eight years. Sole proprietors, including independent contractors and owners of S-corporations, limited liability companies, and partnerships can take a 20% deduction on their net qualified business income, which is defined as any ordinary non-investment business income. But there are limits on who can take the deduction, depending on income thresholds, the type of business, wage tests, and qualified property tests. And we'll go through some of those. Under traditional tax rules, having a trade or business requires continuous and regular activity with a profit motive. However, this rule, the rule for this deduction might not be this strict. For example, Owning a single piece of rental property is probably not considered a business under the general rules of taxation. However, the 199A deduction does specifically allow uh, a deduction for REIT dividends, or real estate investment trust dividends, which are very passive. The bottom line on this question is it's still open until we get guidance from the Treasury Department and IRS. But many tax advisors believe that most real estate activity is likely to qualify as a business for purposes of getting the 20% deduction. We just don't know for sure yet. But what are these income thresholds that I mentioned? Well, the answer is it's clear that if you're in business for yourself or you own a pass-through business and your qualified taxable income is less than $157,500 as a single filer or double that amount, $315,000 as a married filer, Congratulations. You can claim the deduction without worrying about the other restrictions. This will likely apply to most real estate agents who are independent contractors as well as owners of all kinds of sole proprietorships. However, you cannot get this deduction if you're performing services as an employee. What happens if you're over these income thresholds? Well, if you make over the $157,500 as a single or $315,000 as a married couple, you cannot claim the full 20% deduction if you're considered a specified service business. However, there is a phase-out of the deduction 
over the next $50,000 of income for single people and $100,000 for joint returns. But what in the world is a specified service business? Well, I'll let you read the, the uh, definition there, but when this deduction was originally devised, it was intended to, to largely exclude people who provide personal services for a living. The big worry was that rank-and-file employees would be tempted to make deals with their employers to become independent contractors and cut themselves in on this deduction. Well, um, you can see the full, full definition, and please note that the definition includes the term brokerage services, which, of course, is very problematic to what we do. But it's not clear that real estate agents and brokers are going to be in this category. But the regulators may think so. The people down at Treasury and IRS are naturally going to think that the word brokerage could lead, lead you to believe that what most ARIA members and NAR members do for a living should probably be included in the definition. However, we are urging the Treasury Department to issue guidance that real estate brokerage services were not meant to be included in the definition of specified service businesses. I can't get into detail due to time, but essentially we're focusing on our product being tangible versus uh, other kinds of brokerage services, mostly dealing with intangibles like stocks and bonds. Well, what are we doing to convince Treasury? Well, we're working with outside tax professionals to help us draft the strongest possible arguments to make real estate brokerages eligible for this deduction, no matter what their income might be. What happens if, if that doesn't work out? Well. If the regulators do decide that brokerage of real estate is considered tainted by this definition, all is not necessarily lost. Many real estate professionals and their businesses have multiple streams of income, some of which may qualify for the deduction, even if they are over the income threshold. For example, let's take a look at a real estate investor. If they go over the threshold, the deduction is limited by the greater of 50% of the W-2 wages they pay in the business, or the sum of 25% of those W-2 wages paid, plus 2.5% of the original cost of qualified property. Now, I know that's a lot to try to digest, but I just want to point out that there are ways out. And let me give you a quick example of somebody who owns a, a commercial office building. Her name is Alice. She owns a building and rents it through her LLC. Her share of the rental income is $800,000 a year. The LLC pays no W-2 wages, but her share of the original cost of the building without land is $10 million. She can deduct either 2.5% of the cost of that building or 20% of her income, whichever is less. And you can see the calculation there, and it ends up giving her a deduction of $160,000, which is very, very significant. Uh, if, if her building share was less than that, the, the amount that she could deduct would be less than that. And for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly go to, to the uh, last slide and uh, talk about when we might see the final rules. Treasury and the IRS, as you might imagine, are facing a, a daunting task in trying to issue guidance for all these changes that came out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. However, this deduction under 199A is one of the highest pro uh, priorities they have. And we're hearing from uh, Treasury officials that some guidance on this issue could be out uh, 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 late, by late summer, certainly, and even possibly as early as next month. And with that, I will. I know there might be some questions, so uh, we'll turn it over so we can uh, talk about what questions you might have. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now, uh, Kirk will handle the Q&A, and he should be online right now. Just trying to find him so I can unmute him. But hello, uh, but everyone, uh, please go ahead and uh, uh, use the chat box to uh, 
send any questions that you have. Make sure that is uh, it's going to everyone so we can all see it. Okay. Okay. I, I have a question here. Uh, it says, "Why long-term and short-term interest rate is going higher, yet uh, cap rate is compressed?" Um, <clears throat> cap cap rate basically uh, is uh, a, a measure of how much money you're making on your money. So if the cost of interest rates go up, um, that's that's going to put pressure on your ability to get a return on that that investment. So high, higher interest rates uh, are are going to prove challenging for for people looking at at trying to get higher cap rates. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, I have one more question here. Uh, it says, I heard the deduction from entertain entertainment had gone away. If you take clients to a sporting event, is the cost deductible? The answer to that is generally no. There's still some open questions about exactly what all that means, and we'll be seeing, looking for guidance there too. But uh, business meals continue to be deductible to the extent of 50% as they were before, but anything that's got entertainment in it is going to not be deductible anymore, generally speaking. One big question I get from realtors all the time is, that, what about when I have a, a, a group of clients over for just a, a meeting, to, to like an open house where there's food? Is that deductible? And the answer is I don't know. Uh, my, my, some of it might depend on how entertaining it is. If it's entertaining and they're having fun, then the answer is no. If they're, if they're bored, then maybe it's deductible to 50%. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have any other questions? Okay, I have one more question here. It says, uh, "Brook, uh, oh, sorry, it keeps going. <laughs> Brokerage does not matter under the income cap." Uh, not quite sure. I understand that question. Uh, uh, I, oh, I, I think I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you're under the income cap, that's right. It doesn't matter whether you're a specified service business. But if they if they declare uh, agents and brokers to be uh, in the category or not, if you're under that income cap, you, you should be able to take the deduction. Again, until we get the final rules, th th there may be some surprises in there, but we think it's pretty clear that people under those income caps will be able to claim the 20% deduction on their net business income. Uh, so it, it's a big deal for, for most of uh, most realtors and, and many brokers. Okay, great. Thank you. We also, uh uh, we had a question about if the slides were going to be available. Yes, the slides will be available. Uh, we will send a follow-up uh, follow uh, email and uh, we'll send some links for you uh, to download the, the presentations. Uh, we also have another question. Is that combined income husband, uh, is that combined income husband brokerage with wife with W-2? I'm not, I'm not uh, Yes, unfortunately okay. it is. This is a case where if you happen to be married to somebody who's successful with a W-2 job and uh, makes over the threshold, that, that you're going to find you're, you're going to lose out because the family income is over the threshold. So uh, that, that's the, going to be the combined taxable income, not the adjusted gross, but taxable income. Okay, great, thank you. I got uh, one more question here. If you have consulting income with brokerage income, is the treaty is it treated differently? It might be. It's, it, consulting is in that definition as well, and it may be that consulting income, depending on what kind of consulting it is and how they end up defining it exactly, is tainted income, and brokerage may or may not be depending on what what happens. But uh, things like real uh, real property management we don't think would be uh, in the definition no matter what, and uh, other types of activities, passive investment and so forth would not be so. Many real estate professionals have 
uh, some of that kind of income as well. And so some of that income likely will qualify for the 20% deduction, but again, until we get the final guidance, we're, we don't have all the answers. All right, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? Okay, it doesn't uh, seem that we have any more questions at the moment. So I want to uh, thank uh, Doug, Rick, and Evan for presenting today, and thank you everybody else for uh, joining in. Uh, we will, like I said before, we will, we will follow up on an email and send uh, the presentations as well as the recording of the webinar uh, so you can download it and keep it for your records. Um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at uh, contact at aria.org. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Doug, Rick, and Evan for presenting today.